I love the idea of two people being joined by being a respite or a salve, a salve for a disability. It's somehow comforting. Do you ever worry about this message, the hero worship, continuing to be a desire or a fantasy in our society? Why do you think women enjoy this type of storyline? Or more specifically, why do you enjoy writing it? No judgment at all, because as I said, I enjoy it. But with our recent political climate, I am questioning myself as to why it comforts me. Thoughts? You know, I think the thing about romance is the fantasy. You, you mentioned fantasy, and um, it's the it's not real. You know, it's the it's the ideal conflict. It's the ideal circumstance. It's um, it's all about the fantasy. Um, and when it's a fantasy, you're in control of it. Um, more than you are in real life. And so to me as a writer, and also as a mental health counselor, because that's what I do in my day job, I feel like there's a clear division in my mind between what constitutes fantasy and what constitutes reality. Things that are okay in fantasy are sometimes not okay in reality. Um, and it's not, I don't feel like when you write something that may not be so great in reality, that it's bad. Um, because you have to understand it's all about the fantasy and it's about level of control. When you're reading something, you're in control. You can shut the book. You don't have to read it. You don't have to keep reading it. Um, in reality, um, sometimes you don't have the same control that you have um, in a book. Um, so I don't find that there's necessarily anything wrong with um, having the fantasy of somebody being a salve or a balm to somebody's uh, wounds or anything like that. In fact, I feel like that's also a concept that's a little bit real. I know that... Um, I've been married almost 23 years now, and I feel like my husband met me at a very touchy time in my life, that if I had not met him when I met him, the road I would have gone down as a human being, y'all wouldn't be seeing and talking to me right now. I mean, I shudder to think where I would be in my life. And I'm not saying that he's 100% the reason that I have the life I have now, but he is <laughs> more than half probably of the reason that I have the life I have now. And, but here's the other thing too, the same goes for him. I mean, if he hadn't met me, I'm not sure. And I don't think he's sure what kind of life he would have. So I don't know that I necessarily think that it's bad. I almost feel like the interdependence, the both characters needing each other is not a bad thing. I know I need my husband and I know he needs me, you know, and to me, that's part of our love relationship. So I don't know that that's necessarily bad. Now getting needy, that's a completely different thing, and that's maybe not so healthy, but um, I, I guess I just don't find a whole lot wrong with it if it's in the healthy range. Now if we're talking stalkery, needy, bad stuff, bad stuff. Also abuse is bad. I mean, I try not to really play, portray any kind of abuse in my novels as being okay. Um, it's always the bad guy doing bad stuff. It's my heroes, I feel like. They always... They might be a jerk or an asshole, but to her, it's like they can't be. You know, she's she's their everything, you know. And so, I don't know. that I'm rambling. Sorry. Um, okay, next question. Um, have you ever had any type of paranormal incident happened? I have. Okay. So, a number of years ago, um, my, my mom and my sister and I, we went to our local college auditorium and they were having a um, psychic in and the psychic was going to do a reading of everybody in the audience. If you wanted one, you didn't have to have one, but you could have one. And so, um, the whole entire time, and she's like literally just going down the row and then up the road, you know, just going down the road. So I'm like sitting in the middle of the auditorium. So I had a little bit of time to think about what I wanted to ask. And the whole entire time I'm thinking, I'm going to ask her why I'm always so scared my husband's going to get in a car accident. Because he li he works about an hour from where we live, and so I always make him call me when he gets to work, you know, because I'm always scared he's going to, you know, get in a bad accident, and I'm not going to know it. Um, if he's late from work, he knows he better darn well call me, because I will fr I will have him dead in a ditch somewhere, you know, if, if he's late from work. Um, so anyway, I was going to ask her, like, why am I always so worried he's going to get in a car accident? Why am I worried he's going to die from something like that? And so the whole entire time I'm thinking this and I keep thinking, I'm rehearsing how I'm going to say it because you have to ask your question in front of the whole audience. And I like was kind of worried about making a fool of myself. Um, 
So it gets to me and right in that split second when I'm getting ready to ask the question, I change my mind about what I'm going to ask. And I ask her, can you see past lives? And she all of a sudden starts choking and she's like, <coughs> you know, and starts like really choking. And then she launches into this giant coughing fit so bad that she had to leave the stage and was gone like 10 minutes getting herself under control. Finally comes back, sits back down. And like, I'm like, oh my God, what the hell did I do? You know, and she sits back down and she looks at me and she says, yes, I can see past lives. And that abandonment issue that you have, that thing that you're always scared of happening to your husband, that's because in a past life you were in the Civil War and everybody that you love died. And that's why you're scared of losing him. What? Like seriously? Like there was no way she could have known that I was going to ask about like my husband getting in a car accident and me being so scared I'm going to lose him. There was no way! And she knew that. So... That's my paranormal incident. So I believe there's some, there's something somewhere some people got. So anyway, um, let's see. What gave you the idea for a lightning strike to open and connect to the hero and heroine? Kind of already talked about that. You guys know. Um, <laughs> will Kent and Camille and the FBI dude get stories? Um, okay. Funny little thing about Kent and Camille, and I don't think I've told anybody but you guys. So Kent and Camille actually were in book one and race the, no, wait, sorry, back up. Kent and Camille weren't always named Kent and Camille. Their original names were Thomas and Ebony. Um, but my editor and Ebony, in case you didn't know, is the heroine in book two and Thomas is who book three is going to be about. But my editor, when I was writing, uh, when I, after I turned in Race to Darkness, she did not think that I portrayed Ebony, who is Camille in this book, um, in a positive light. And she did not think that readers would want to follow a heroine um, from this book to the next book. Um, so she made me change their names and make them have nothing to do with um, Thomas and Ebony. And I had a hard time with that because they were originally, like I said, Thomas and Ebony. And um, so um, Kent and Camille themselves, no, they will not get anything else. Um, Kent, if the series gets, maybe uh, if the series goes on, maybe Kent might get a book four or five. I don't know. I, like I said, I don't play in my books. I, I couldn't tell you. Um, but maybe Kent, because I did like Kent's character. And um, hold on just a second. Dobby wants up here. Um, in case you didn't know, here's Dobby. He's um, the inspiration for Killer. Um, <laughs> he's hearing my email come in. Sorry. Um, He's a little Chihuahua Boston Terrier mix, and um, he just likes to be held, so he might be up here a while. Um, so anyway, Kent and Camille, they probably won't make another appearance. Camille definitely won't, but Kent might, maybe, maybe, maybe. Um, FBI dude, you're talking about Gil, I'm assuming. Well, no, maybe you're not talking about Gil, because this is Race to Darkness. Um, not sure exactly who FBI dude you mean, unless you mean Lathan. And Lathan will be, is what, who book two is about. Um, so anyway, um, let's see, what was your writing process for Race of the Darkness? Um, like I said, I don't plot, I don't plan, I just sit down and write, and we'll see where things go and what's going to happen. Um, normally, I have, a, I have a day job, I'm a mental health counselor, and I um, usually write at night, like after, my husband has to wake up at four in the morning to go to work, so... He's up really early and goes to bed really early. So I always stay up late and not late, but 11-ish and write. He goes to bed about 7 and I usually write from about 7 to 11 before I have to go to bed. And then um, on my days off, I spend them writing. Um, I have no life. I'm a writer. Um, and how long did it take you to write the book from concept to completion? About a year. Um, I don't know why. It just takes me a year. I, well, back up. I do know why. Part of the reason why it takes me a year is because... 
uh, I have to rewrite everything so much. Because like I said, I have to write something like five different times until I find the version of it that's going to take me on the journey. Um, I r overwrite, I underwrite, I have to go back and edit as I write. I just can't get a first draft down. I have to like edit as I go. So every chapter, when I get done with the chapter, is as perfect as I can get that chapter. However, the next chapter, I might add in some crazy element that makes me have to go back and change stuff in that first chapter. And so, and I will do that as I'm writing because I just, I, I just can't move on if the chapter, the, like each chapter has to be perfect before I can move on. Um, so it's about a year and I wish, I so wish I could write faster, but I just can't. I, it's, I've tried. Doesn't happen. Um, let's see.